This is the Panasonic GH2. This camera's been out for over 10 years now, and it's been pretty well known in the video community since its release. I mean, all of the Panasonic GH cameras, all the way from this one to the GH5, have all been super well known for recording really high quality video while still being fairly budget friendly. However, now the Panasonic GH2, like I said, is over 10 years old now, and you can pick it up for around $200 used. And for that $200 price point, this Panasonic GH2 records pretty good quality 1080p video up to 30 frames a second. It has a microphone input jack, it has a decent fully articulating touchscreen display, a micro four thirds interchangeable lens mount, and it's super light and compact. You know, in comparison to other $200-ish cameras like the Canon EOS M or the Sony NEX, 5N or really any of the Sony NEX series. This camera basically takes the best things from the EOS M from the Sony NEX line and just kind of puts them together right in this camera body. And I think for $200, this is one of the best bang for the buck cameras you can get for recording video. So I'm gonna go over the features of this camera. Also, I'm gonna go over the quirks and the downsides. And of course, I'm gonna show you some video examples that I took with this camera. So without further ado, let's get right into the features of the Panasonic GH2. So this camera records 1080p video at 24 and 30 frames a second. However, it records that 1080p video at quite a bit of a higher bit rate than other cameras in its class. Like for example, the Sony NEX cameras recorded about 20 to 25 megabits per second. And even like the Canon C100 cinema camera and the Sony FS100 cinema camera record at about 24 to 25 megabits a second as well. However, the GH2 is right around 35 to 40 megabits per second. So in theory, it's going to record more data in each frame of your video. However, personally, I haven't really noticed much of a difference. You know, maybe it's a little easier to color grade, but that's really about it. However, it's still nice to know that it records quite a bit higher bit rate than most other mirrorless cameras in its price range. Now this doesn't do 1080p 60 frames a second, however it can do 720p up to 60 frames a second, which of course is a lot lower resolution, it's not going to be as sharp as 1080p video, but you can still record at least something in 60 frames a second if you need to get that slow motion video. Another great note to mention about this camera is its screen. So like I said, this is a fully articulating touchscreen display, which is another thing that is very uncommon in any cameras in this price range, and especially cameras of this age. Because the touchscreen is surprisingly responsive, you can move stuff around on it, you can use it to change settings, change your focus point and stuff like that. It's fully articulating, so if you vlog or just record yourself like in a studio setting like what I'm doing right now, it's really easy to do with that as well. And overall, I think this is probably one of the best displays you can get in this $200 price range. You know, cameras like the Sony NEX cameras, which I talk about all the time, they have these tilting displays that obviously don't flip around, they don't flip really anywhere else, just kind of up and down a little bit. And that's about it. And also the Canon EOS M, which I talked about, is kind of a main competitor of this, has a fully fixed screen, so you can't move it at all. However, it is touchscreen, but it's nowhere near as good as this fully articulating touchscreen on the GH2. So with autofocus, like I said, you can move your focus point around the screen with the touchscreen by just pretty much dragging around anywhere you want. However, if you shoot in manual focus or use manual lenses, you can also tap the touchscreen anywhere you want to zoom in to check your focus. And that really helps out with trying to focus because instead of just zooming in the middle or having to really mess around with the buttons or dials or something to get your focus point wherever you want it, for manual focus, you can just pretty much tap wherever you want to zoom in on or wherever your focus point is to get manual focus on. Next up, the HDMI output on this is really nice. It has a mini HDMI, so it's not as good as a full-size HDMI. However, it is much better than micro HDMI. And just in general, the display over HDMI just looks really clean. You know, all the settings are all around on the sides and the corners. Uh, but it doesn't take up too much of the display. They're really just clean and really well put out there. That's something you usually don't even think about, but it's really nice to see that. And it's just honestly just a really clean HDMI output. Now, speaking of clean HDMI outputs, this camera also does have clean HDMI output. If you want to use this for a webcam or for an external recorder or something like that, it's really finicky to get it as a clean display. Usually there's just a setting in the settings of your camera that says 
you know, like info display on or off. And obviously turn that off for clean HDMI output. However, on this, there isn't that. You really have to go through the settings and just turn everything off manually, kind of. It's, it's really finicky, but you can get a clean HDMI output, which is good for a webcam. However, it doesn't output audio through the HDMI. So you're gonna need to record audio internally or, you know, however you wanna work around that. It just does not output audio through the HDMI, which is, Another little finicky thing that it does. Also when it comes to, you know, assists and displays, um, there is a histogram, zebras, and audio level display on this camera. Another great thing to mention is of course the lens mount. So this is a micro four thirds lens mount, which means you can adapt almost any type of lens to this. Obviously you can use native micro four thirds lenses, but if you want to adapt, say, vintage lenses or just other DSLR lenses, you can almost adapt anything to Micro Four Thirds and you can even use speed boosters. There's just a ton of lens options for it, which is awesome. Pretty much anything from Canon EF lenses, Nikon lenses to Canon FD vintage lenses or pretty much any vintage lens you can adapt to this camera. And so those are all the awesome features you get with this $200 camera. I really think this is one of the best bang for the buck cameras you can get for around $200. However, there is some quirks to mention that I'm going to bring up right now. Things that may be deal breakers for you depending on what type of video you want to use this camera for. So let's just get right into those. First of all, like I said, it has a microphone input jack which is super nice so you can plug in you know, good quality microphones into this camera. However, it's a really weird 2.5mm port which means any microphone that you have with a standard 3.5mm jack isn't going to plug into this. You're going to need to get an adapter, something like this right here, so this is just two and a half millimeter to three and a half millimeter adapter. If you want something like this, I'll link this one down in the description. I just got it from Amazon. They're pretty cheap, but it is kind of annoying to use, but at least you can still use regular microphones. You just have to get in a little adapter. Next up, when it comes to just the menus and going through settings and changing simple things, this camera's just a little finicky. I really don't know how to explain it further than that. Probably just because it has an old software, it's just not as intuitive as newer cameras are. But going through the menu, finding different settings, and just changing simple things, it's just a little finicky. It takes a little bit longer with this camera. Of course, I haven't used it for like a long, long time. I'm sure if you use this camera for months and months as your main camera, you'd pretty much get used to it and just fly through everything pretty easily. But it is just a little bit of a finicky camera to use. Next up, there's no focus peaking in this camera. That's a pretty big deal for me because with this camera, um, the autofocus isn't very good at all. You pretty much mostly want to use manual focus. And focus peaking is just so nice to have for making sure you nail your focus. Of course, like I said, it has the tap to zoom focus where you can zoom in to check focus. But personally, I'd much rather have focus peaking than that zoom in focus assist. So that kind of sucks. But if you use an external monitor, a lot of those have focus peaking built in. So there's ways to get around it. It's just kind of annoying. And lastly, I kind of touched on this already, but the autofocus in the camera is not very reliable. If you've had any other Panasonic cameras in the past, you know that in general they're just not as good, not as reliable as like Sony or Canon autofocuses. 
And especially being that this camera, like I said, is over 10 years old, you can't really expect much from the autofocus system. The focus does work. It takes a little bit to grab focus and it's not the most reliable thing in the world, but it does work if you're not in a rush at all or if your object isn't really moving at all. But personally, I'd recommend just using manual focus with this camera. But if you're recording video, I think this camera is an awesome option. I think you should definitely look into it if you're on that really tight $200-ish budget. But either way, that wraps this video up. Thank you so much for watching. Definitely go down, hit the like button, and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And I'll see you in the next one.